All right, so we are recording on Zoom, and we're streaming this up to YouTube. I could stop this. That would. So YouTube is getting something, and it says one person's watching, but that might be me. Woo All right. Okay. Um, and should we go ahead and pretend this is how? We're, I mean, can you can hear me enough to sort of like um, think we can get get by? Yes. Yeah. Actually, if I close my eyes and don't look at the the video, yeah, it's probably a lot easier and less confusing. <laughs> uh, although I'll look a little peculiar. <laughs> I mean, I could. Um, what else could I do? I could. That's too bad that the video that you're bandwidth. I think we're going to blame that on your bandwidth. You're using just your cell phone, right? And so you you blame that on me? Yeah. Dude. I think because I can see YouTube is getting the video sure it's getting that all right so I assume zoom is doing okay all right that's getting better okay all right should we um, should I share this on Facebook in case anyone wants to watch <laughs> as the last uh, that, that I leave up to you you have complete control. Yeah. Um, I did tell somebody I would share the link. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the Zoom link because that will be the most fun for someone to join. Um, so they could watch this scintillating conversation as it's, they, as it's they, they actually could join it wow. if they use the Zoom link. Um, So they could muscle in on the conversation. They could. Yeah, but I'm the host. They I have control over whether or not they, um, you know, it could kick them out or mute them or whatever. <laughs> and actually, I posted the Zoom link onto Twitter. So technically, anyone in the world could, you know. Or any of your followers. Well, yeah, anyone that notices it on. Yeah. All right. So. How many followers do you have on Twitter? Not many. Okay. Uh, there, I posted the link. Maybe you can edit it to say something like. You're very dark. Yeah, I could turn a light on. <laughs> like you're in a shadowy room, I can just see your disembodied face. Really? Around. <laughs> With the weird sort of halo effect from your microphone. That you're <laughs> like some sort of dark angel. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, first test live broad cast of my podcast. Mindful activist happening now. Two ways to watch join. That and uh, and then um. Another link I should go. Hmm. Nine fifteen. That's not too bad for a late start. Although officially we still haven't really started. Right. <laughs> Unless this is just the nature of the interview. That's no, like, no, yeah. I actually do want us to. Oh, hey, how's it going? Someone just joined us. Excellent. Oh yeah, I see another dot. There's another dot. <laughs> uh, his name is H, but he left. He, left. <laughs> he did. It was like a flyby. That was pretty wild, though. Look, I mean, I guess that's from Twitter. Someone just joined in. Yeah, he buzzed the tower. Yeah.
Oh, that was that was an experience. Someone just joined our meeting. <laughs> All right, how do I? Uh, I'm going brain dead here for um, how to share this uh, other video. Okay, I think I found it. Great. You're coming through really smooth now. Sweet. Maybe that flyby visitor uh, was the key. You blocked the uh, passages. <laughs> Unblocked. I think you just need to not move around so much. That flyby visitor. Okay. Right, yeah, I'm, I'm, this is it. I'm going to post this link. Maybe I'll like send it to uh, the couple of the five people on Facebook. I told about this. I'll send them the link also. Okay. And then we'll officially start the interview and I will stop <laughs> the technical <laughs> stuff, which is totally distracting. Well, so that's uh, it's, uh, uh, send a text message to that one. Can I do that? <laughs> So I think I was smart not to promote this to like everyone because this is a little bit I call a rough start. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're gonna call that. That's enough technical work and a little bit of sharing, and we are broadcasting and we're recording. Um, All right, so uh, we're gonna begin. So I'm gonna do a little intro, ready? Hey out there, this is Matt Reddy, the uh, host of the Mindful Activist Podcast. This is our first live episode. And um, with me today is Christopher Mason. Um, thank you for being here today, Chris. My pleasure, thank you for having me. And, um, why don't you introduce yourself? How would you like to introduce yourself to our vast audience? <laughs> well, I think you just did such a comprehensive job. There really <laughs> isn't much for me to add to that. <laughs> yes, your name is uh, Chris. People probably, people probably have a very clear sense of, of who I am and what I stand for at this point. <laughs> Do you, I mean, would you, you want me to introduce you? Like the way I would? <laughs> <laughs> or, you're, why don't you, or you could just... How would you want it? I mean, again, you know, we sort of talked about this in our last, uh, our last uh, interview on air together, although it wasn't on this show, how you would want to be introduced to an audience of random viewers. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think if you just start talking about me and then, um, then I'll interrupt as you go and, uh, and fill in some of the blanks. Okay. All right. Um, well, uh, so it is great having Chris here today. Chris is a really old friend of mine. Um, he's very, very old, as you can see, aged. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yes, uh, we met at the University of Maryland, um, in College Park, Maryland, and we, true. Yes, as we were both philosophy majors, and uh, some of us more than others, though. Oh, it was, it was, you're saying between us, one of us was more the philosopher than the other. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? No, I think we were both pretty committed to the yes. philosophy track. Yeah. Yeah. That was our, absolutely. Yeah. Um, to, to the bones. And you entered college as a philosophy major. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. I entered as a mechanical engineering major. Um, right. So you're a convert. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we became bosom buddies uh, in in college, and you know we 
we explored life and uh, went through school um, our, during that one year at University of Maryland and then the next year uh, back at the University of Bristol where there was an exchange program uh, and you were doing your final year and I did my third year of college there. Um, and, uh, and we had adventures together. Had many Glorious adventures. adventures. Many adventures. And yeah, exploring the dark underbelly of Bristol. Yeah. Yeah. And we traveled around Europe and down to the Keys together. And, um, and then eventually, you know, uh, both graduated and sort of like went off in our different ways for many years. And you lived in a community and eventually you became a police officer in a small town in Vermont. I did. Yes. And uh, you have your own TV show, local access TV show, just like Wayne's world. <laughs> <laughs> Very similar. It's modeled on Wayne's world. Actually, that was, uh, that's what I based it on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Called Middlebury five. Oh, yep. yes. I mean, so I guess I left, left my hippie days behind me, cut my hair, gave up my career as a professional artist and moved to Vermont and became a police officer. Yeah. And how's that going for you? It's going great. I'm loving it. <laughs> Wonderful. I love being a police officer. Yeah. Not a, is there a lot of uh, violent crime in the small town where you live? It's really very little crime at all so <clears throat> i would say almost no violent crime a little bit here and there but um very very tiny amount and, and crime in general a very very low rate of crime middlebury is a very small town there's only about six and a half thousand people in middlebury well um there's only one question that i've considered standard for this show um <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so this could be a very brief interview. <laughs> well, that, that question, it, it, you know, um, it's a launching point. Depends on. The question is, what is your favorite color? <laughs> yes. well, you brought that up. Do you have a favorite color? Oh, purple. Definitely purple. Mine too. Jeez. Yeah. Okay. I didn't actually know that. Okay. Uh, the question that I've asked in all previous interviews is uh, do you consider yourself an activist um sort of i consider myself a revolutionary really well that's that's a yeah. step up from activist i would say yeah maybe so yeah so why do you uh can you expand on that why do you consider yourself a revolutionary I believe joy is a revolutionary act. And I'm a very joyful person. I'm very happy. So in just pursuing um, uh, joy as sort of like the, the purpose of your life, you've, that's, uh, that's why you can see yourself revolutionary. Absolutely. So not in, you're not uh, saying in terms of social revolution of major power structures in the world. That's not your. Um, that's not a focus of yours. No, no. I've very deliberately decided not to focus upon that. And why is that? Because I don't feel like I have the the insight to be able to affect change in a reliably positive manner. This is wild. So yeah, another person just uh, jumped in for a second. Um, yeah, that. <laughs> uh, so I feel like I, I, you know, I have some ideas. I have a sense of what a, an enlightened political system might be um, but I'm aware that it's such a complicated thing that I can't possibly have complete insight and my notions of what constitute a, a positive political system may themselves be flawed. So in trying to affect change on that level, I might very well 
have a negative impact upon the world. So I don't, I don't feel a tremendous amount of confidence that if I dedicated myself to that, the, the outcome would be positive. Whereas if I dedicate myself to, to personal happiness, there's a lot greater chance that the impact will be positive. It's a lot more reliable. So you, um, so you're hesitant to, uh, to be a, at all, um, a sort of a puppet master for what goes on in the world. Cause you don't have confidence. You really know what to do, what to change so that the world would be a better place. Correct. Yeah. Yes. I'm not, I'm not really an idealistic person in that sense. In, in the sense, in, in what sense? In the sense of affecting change on a macroscopic level, impacting world politics or even national politics. Because you, uh, but that's because you, you just don't, it's not because you don't care or do not care what happens on a macroscopic scale like that. Um, well, I would say that, that I care that it affects me, but um, things, that are, things that are closer to me, things that are the more immediate, impact me far more. So I, I choose to focus my energies on those things. So it's a, it's a fairly abstract sense of caring. So it doesn't have the, the immediacy and the vigor of my tangible relationships and my connections within the community in which I live. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a topic that I sort of, um, I think about all the time, the, the pursuit of personal, uh, personal happiness in our sort of the microcosm of our individual life versus mm -hmm. pursuing uh, anything to do with trying to make the world a better place. Because um, they really are, they're very different spheres of life. And, uh, um, and I've been spending a lot of time over the last, uh, last three years, more than I ever have before in my life, sort of like spent a lot of energy focused on um, trying to think how can we change the world in a way to make it uh, much better. And uh, it takes a lot of attention away from, it can take a lot of attention away from your personal, personal uh, joy, personal happiness to focus on such big things. And in a large part of myself, I don't feel, I, I don't feel like my personal happiness is tied to the, the state of the world. I don't have, I don't have much problem to, you know, separating those two things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to me so often idealism is rendered ironic through politics. Yeah. What do you mean by that? So when there's a, a passionate, um, fairly, rigid sense of how things should be and a, a country a group of people works towards that end and they're successful it seems that often the the consequences are in many ways the opposite of what they were ostensibly struggling to achieve yeah so there'll be a, a struggle for, for freedom and liberty and the, the consequences will be oppression. Yeah. Some very violent form of, of cleansing, brutality. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, my perspective on the, uh, the, the people that, that make a uh, big effort to try to lead movements to, to really change their countries over the course of history. Um, they get caught up in the power they gain through trying to change their country, change the state of things. And then, um, 
I think they just sort of get addicted to, to having the power over what the, what decisions are made about resources and situations. And they, they don't, and maybe also they just didn't, no one's ever really known how to implement a government that was not, not prone to oppression. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's just never really been, no one's really never, you know, Socrates, he had the theory of the, uh, or, or Plato had the theory of the philosopher king. You know, the idea that we just need to put in power an incredibly wise person or people. That's, that's the solution. Sure. It ne never has seemed to work. <laughs> it's just not the way <laughs> power works. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I think I idealism itself is toxic. Idealism is toxic? Yes. The notion that you absolutely know what is right, what is fundamentally correct, and that fused with the desire to impose it upon the world, I think it is a toxic thing. Yeah, there's, a, there's nothing, um, you know, I mean, there's lots of self-righteous people in the world, but uh, activists, very self-righteous in their idealism. And uh, I think it like, it can really hold up uh, activists from working together um, because they have, they're, they're, very, they're very fixated on their, their own ideas of what is right and what is best and what is most important. I mean, encountered that a ton in the, in the Occupy movement while facilitating you know, general assemblies. It's a lot of people with a good heart everyone basically knows they want, you know, they want to reduce oppression in the world and make things more fair, but people have different priorities and uh, it's very tricky facilitating and helping groups like that come together so they can do, make any sort of action uh, that's productive. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, one of the big problems is that our model, the, the framework that we have for making sense of, of issues and political systems even is very it, it works upon a, a polarized model an adversarial model so typically you have two competing systems of, of thought of politics whatever it might be and they're struggling together for ascendancy and that that model is fundamentally oppressive where one has power over the other so often when there's a movement for social change it accepts that model in in some in some sense so so the struggle is to you know combat oppression but the, the goal is to in a sense become the the oppressor and it, i don't think it's stated in those terms i don't you know this is a, a massive reduction but i think when people approach it approach an issue or a, a struggle whatever it might be it's it's perceived on some level in those terms because those are the mental frameworks that we that we've inherited from the from the enlightenment pretty much from our, our modernist mode of, of thought so it's one or the other there's a dichotomy there and even if you replace the the power the structure goes unchallenged. The fundamental structure goes unchallenged. And it's hard. It's hard to perceive. It's hard to even conceive of a of a struggle that doesn't, in some sense, follow that that model. That doesn't accept that framework on some level because it's just so pervasive and so ubiquitous. Well, and we've talked about this um, a bit before because uh, you're one of the few people that I've talked at length with about the, the project that I'm working on here, that this, this podcast really only exists to help um, sort of support um, that, that project, the, the Global Consensus Project. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we, uh, why don't we like... Um, pivot a little bit and talk a little bit about that. And, you know, then I'll get sort of get your feedback on um, your thoughts on its potential or uh, lack thereof or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> sure.
Sure. <laughs> yeah. um, so one thing I'm learning, which I guess you probably uh, are well aware of, when you are the host, it is so, if you it is very tricky to be focused on the the conversation and also pay attention to other stuff like any other stuff about the the show absolutely technical stuff i mean oh man i do not have enough brain power so i mean we, we actually have had a a few people watching and, and they've sent me a few messages um mm -hmm. So I don't think they're watching anymore, but a couple people at least gave it a shot. <laughs> That's because you ignored them. <laughs> well, the way this is supposed to work, let me, let me at least, uh, this is my theory of how these, these shows, at least some shows are, are going to work. So this is not intended to be just you and me um, or me and uh, one or two people having a conversation and that being the show. Um, that could be one type of show. But the more exciting form of the show uh, that I that I am all this technical setup is for is for a potentially a of audio video experience that could potentially have hundreds of thousands of people participating, mm -hmm. and it is I think I mean technically I have it set up right now. This could scale to uh, a thousand people um, it would need uh, and the way it would do that I don't know should I explain that I don't know if you really care if there was a <laughs> there were some geeks watching but it, it could do it video wise because we're using this zoom um, software now this this room uh, the zoom chat software that um, we're using is we have a free account and anyone can create a free account and with a free account, you can host a video conference like this with up to 50 people. Um, and I actually shared the link on Twitter and on Facebook. And so uh, that's why people have been dropping in. Technically up to 50 people could be in this video conference. Um, and so that's one way that this scales up is just um, now, but there's limits to what you can do with uh, a bunch of people on video. Uh, there's a limit to how well you can really communicate with that group of people. Um, and so the global consensus project that I've been working on is how do you scale up so that you have an egalitarian uh, meeting where everyone participating is as equal as possible. Um, how do you scale that up beyond 20 or 30 people? Because as a, a consensus facilitator can, can do pretty well with 20 to 30 people facilitating a very egalitarian consensus meeting, but it doesn't really go above that. And so um, this Zoom software is just sort of the one audio, it's the audio video sort of tool we could use to support that. But the software that I've designed at the Global Consensus Project is made to give a more meaningful way um, or to give a viable way to, to interact with thousands of people at once. So we could potentially be speaking to them and the mass of people could be responding to us. Um, and why don't I go, I know I've shown this to you before, but I'll like, um, I'm going to share my screen and show it a little bit to, uh, and I don't know how well you'll be able to see it. So we'll see. You're on you're, cause you're on an iPhone, you don't have a desktop, so uh, we're gonna see how well you can follow this. All right. Uh, yeah. And I won't do this too long. Mm -hmm. Just let me know if you want me to just start talking. Well, do you, I mean, are you, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Do you, uh, do you feel like you know enough about the project to, to comment on it um, as I'm like pulling it up? 
Well, probably not, but that you, doesn't necessarily distract me from. <laughs> Sorry again. All right, that won't happen again. <laughs> Let's see, did that work? All right. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing screen? Sure. Yep. Yeah. I can see a screen. All right. There's lots of information on it, but it's way too small for me to read. Right. Uh, maybe you'll get the gist of what they're looking at here. And let me see. Did you just start playing the banjo? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm having the darn, I'm having the darn technical uh, thing again. Because now cause I'm, it's like there's what you're seeing and there is what I got to change this. Stop sharing screen. I shared the I did the wrong screen. In order to keep in order to keep our YouTube audience involved, I have to share a different screen. Okay. Otherwise they are left out, even though there is no YouTube audience. Right. <laughs> All right. Um so basically what we're looking at is um in theory if we were we, we could be doing this show um and if our goal was to facilitate uh a conversation between us and a massive audience of any size they could be using this interface um which we desi I designed to interact with us sure and um Let's go in here. So in theory, in theory, we could, uh, uh, any number of people could be logged in here and we could set the topic um, of the conversation. Uh, and that's in this, this window over here on the left, you set the topic and that's, um, this topic right now is unleash the fury, uh, but not really much of a conversation topic, but. Um, that's the topic of this conversation is unleash the fury. <laughs> that's the, no, of this one on the screen. Oh, okay. Uh, in the, so the way the, um, the software is sort of uh, designed, um, it's sort of like topics are nodes. Uh, in a network, and they are they are sort of threaded. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can bring one that'll make more sense. So I'm going into the the, the mindful activist um, uh, node, and the only topic, the first topic in there is "Ask Me Anything," which is just for the mindful activist podcast. Anyone could um, can ask any question. And so I don't know if you're able to, are you able to see this at all on your, your little iPhone? I can, I can see it, but it's way too small for me to read it. Okay. So you can get I can the, see the general structure of it. And that's fine. That's for now. That's, that's really, that works. And so imagine if there were, um, if there were a ton of people in here, they could be posting questions and the questions you post down here, um, or like, who is this guy? <laughs> People could post questions or these could be responses to a question and people can vote up and down these in real time. And we'd be able to see that as that's one sort of way that this mob of viewers could be interacting. They could be making statements and voting up statements. Um, and that'd be one sort of reflection. Oh, your free meeting will end in 10 minutes. Upgrade to a paid account. All right, that's something I gotta keep in mind. They have a 40 minute limit to these. Uh, <laughs> stay with free. Uh, so we might have to like stop the meeting and restart it. Okay. <laughs> um, and then I'll just finish the little tour of the interface as it is now. And then 
while we are uh, speaking, our video could be here in the middle screen. Um, and then uh, people can sparkle up, sparkle down, and raise their hand down here. Um, there is a chat window for just the masses of people to just sort of um, to be able to, to chat about uh, you know things that aren't like specifically tied to the focus topic. And then down here in the right is uh, this is a place for video responses. So if people actually um, are capable of it, and it's not that tricky to they can actually record a video of what they have to say and and upload it uh, to YouTube, they could actually paste the video response here. Um, and again, any thousands of people could do that simultaneously and you can vote up and down video responses. So that would be another way for us to sort of get from a mass of people, um, see what uh, video responses they find most interesting. So and anyways, I mean, it, it is, it's, it probably sounds a little bit chaotic, um, but all of this is to sort of replicate the amount of power um, uh, that you have when you have face to face with like people you have certain they have a certain ability to do stuff to interact and to express themselves so I'm trying to give people a way to express themselves and uh, whoever is facilitating a meaningful way to understand what the masses of people participating are actually thinking so they can help shape the discussion and move um, the people to making decisions they want to make Does that make that make any sense absolutely really for sure <laughs> all right uh i'm gonna have to practice that uh, you know <laughs> <laughs> um okay so all right so we got this seven minute countdown on the timer um Okay. Because of the free session, we could just stop the meeting and restart it. I don't think there's any problem with that. Uh, so you game to do that? Sure. All that right. works for me. All right. So I'm going to send you a new link. I'm going to stop this meeting and send a new link. All right. Okay. Sure.